Okay, good evening. Welcome to the 53rd Annual Meeting of the Psychonomic Society. My name is Jeff Zox, and it is my honor and privilege to chair the governing board of the Society this year. Um, I'm very eager to hear John Anderson's keynote address, uh, so I'll be as brief as possible, but I do have a few important announcements. First, I would like to invite you all to the reception immediately following the keynote tonight in the foyer just outside. Second, I'd like to invite any runners to join the inaugural Friday morning fun run at the um, always popular hour of 6 a.m. We will convene in the lobby and hit the road uh, at 6.15 sharp. It will be uh, a, a, a very um, jog-friendly five miles that you can cut short if you're not feeling it. it will, and no one will be left behind. Third, I want to encourage everyone to come to the business meeting on Saturday at 4.40 back in this room. We'll be recognizing winners of the, of the Journal Best Article Awards and reporting on the strategic planning process that has taken place this year. There's really much good news, uh, and I, I hope you'll come to learn more about it. Um, and we saved you a seat because it's in, in this very room. Um, and those of you who've been to board meetings past know that there will be seats available. Uh, a few words about one of the new initiatives that the society has undertaken. The Board of Governors voted in 2011 to establish an outstanding early career award to recognize exceptional research accomplishments among our members. Nominees must have completed their terminal degree, typically the PhD, no more than 10 years prior to the year the award is given and must be a member or associate member of the society. Nominations are made by members of the society and each candidate must be endorsed by two members. Up to four awards can be made each year. Um, to present these awards, I'd like to introduce Reed Hunt, Chair of the Award Committee and immediate past Chair of the Governing Board. Reed? Thank you. Uh, the committee this year consisted of Kathleen Moore and uh, me from the Governing Board. And representing the members uh, were uh, Dave Belota, uh, Marsha Johnson, and Tom Sintel. Uh, we want to congratulate all of the nominees on their uh, marvelous accomplishments. Uh, their credentials were indeed uh, uh, terribly impressive. Um, but now, on behalf of the committee and the governing board, I'm uh, really pleased to introduce to you uh, the winners of this year's Psychonomic Society Early Career Awards. Uh, Sian Bailak from the University of Chicago. Scott Brown from uh, the University of Newcastle, Australia, left me an email in the middle of my night last night, uh, letting me know that his plane was three hours late out of Sydney and that he would be here at 8.30. Uh, but uh, if you see Scott around the conference, please do congratulate him. Thomas Griffiths, University of California, Berkeley. and Nash Unsworth, University of Oregon. These are the 2012 winners of the Psychonomic Society Early Career Award. Thank you. And now, Rob Nasoski, member of the Governing Board, will introduce tonight's uh, keynote speaker. I'm both uh, delighted and honored to introduce our keynote speaker for this year's meeting of the Psychonomic Society. John Anderson is one of the true giants of our field. For many decades, 
His work has inspired researchers throughout the world in experimental psychology, cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, computer science, and education. In his early work, he developed sophisticated models of human declarative memory based on richly described semantic networks. Soon after, he modeled procedural memory in terms of systems of production rules. These combined declarative and procedural memory systems were the key components of his ACT theory, the most influential unified theory of cognition that our field has known. The generality and precision with which ACT and its descendants have explained high-level human cognition is nothing short of breathtaking. Along the way in his developments of ACT, John also pursued what he called rational analyses of cognition. In brief, he considered the issue of how the mind might be adapted to the statistical structure of the environment. This led to the creative idea that huge progress could be made into understanding the mind by viewing it from a rational Bayesian perspective. Indeed, he foresaw, he foresaw decades ago what has become one of the most influential modern approaches to studying cognition. Yet another of John's major avenues has been to build intelligent computer-based tutors around the ACT theory. His novel theory-based approach to, the, to developing cognitive tutors has been remarkably successful with the tutors used in thousands of schools nationwide. It provides a beautiful example of how basic theorizing in cognitive psychology can be applied to have significant impact in education. And finally, over the past decade or two, John has extended his ACTAR theory to make quantitative predictions of patterns of activation in the brain, as detected in experiments with fMRI. Indeed, he's among the first in our field to develop rigorous connections between cognitive level models expressed in formal mathematical terms and underlying neural mechanisms. I'm not going to recite the enormous number of honors and awards that John has received throughout his amazing career, because I'd like to reserve a little bit of time for his actual talk. Okay. Instead, I thought I would leave you with my own mind's personal representation of his accomplishments. I've already mentioned that one of John's ideas is that the mind comes to internalize the statistical structure of the environment. Well, my mind has internalized a decision variable that I'll call um, awesomeness. Awesomeness. Um, it's some combination of a researcher being incredibly smart, creative, hardworking, tackling big issues, showing bravery and foresight, and influencing the work of our entire field. My internal distribution looks something like this. Okay. So the x-axis is plotting awesomeness, and the y-axis is plotting, is showing the relative frequency of people in the world who have that degree of awesomeness. Unfortunately, I'm not very good with PowerPoint, so I needed to use a multi-slide figure to communicate to you the statistical distribution that my mind has internalized. Okay, so here, the distribution is continuing to its tails, and now it's continuing to outer space. And here's my, here's my mental representation of John. So uh, please join me in providing a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, John Anderson. Oh, gee. Um. I see I got a 9 out of 10 from <laughs> Rob Masofsky. <laughs> um, so, um, <clears throat> one of the things I did look forward to was hearing Rob say something nice about me, so it worked out just well. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so um, why don't I start my talk? Um, so, this is a pretty common sight now. Uh, but we can ask ourselves, uh, how much has neural imaging really told us about the human mind? Certainly the case that it's told us a lot about uh, cognition, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I would argue that it has not done well 
so far in analyzing the structured complex thought. And there's something that has worried me for some time, given that it's such a dominant methodology now, which is that we're going to come to believe that the human mind is only capable of what we can find in brain imaging studies. Uh, so I've been <coughs> asking myself, is there a way that we could take this dominating methodology and reveal something about what humans are really capable of? Now for me, what humans are really capable of is mathematical problem solving. And that is challenging to study even in terms of behavioral methods. And <clears throat> that is because it's so variable in the solutions people produce, how long it takes. And this is um, <clears throat> particularly problematic, you might think at least, for imaging research because imaging, at least traditionally, has relied on averaging over trials to see what the pattern is. However, what, I've what I'm going to describe is a way we found to take individual trials and extract significant generalizations from those trials. Uh, <clears throat> and we've done this by essentially combining two fairly well-developed methodologies, uh, multivoxel pattern analysis and hidden Markov models. So uh, to just lay out where I'm going, I'm going to start out with a demonstration. I'm going to show you a student solving, uh, uh, doing mathematical problem solving for five minutes and show you how we can track what they're doing over those five minutes. And then I'm going to show how we've extended this to do theory discovery, to discover a new model for a high-level problem-solving task. And then I'm going to, it's a, it'll be a, a kind of a sketch of a model, really, but I'll also show you how we flesh this down into a, a, a kind of familiar information processing model of what's going on. And then I'm going to return to something that is kind of in the background, sort of in the weeds, but it's really what's critical, is all this depends on analyzing what's happening on individual trials. So I'm going to try to <coughs> show you some of the insights that you can get by looking at single trials. Uh, so I'm going to start with something <coughs> we affectionately call the cerebroscope. And you're going to see uh, a student going through a, it's a very stripped down tutoring system but they're going to be solving a sequence of seven problems in an algebra involving collection of constants. You're going to see a movie that runs at two times real time. Um, on the left, you're going to see what the student actually sees and does. The student interacts with the system uh, with a mouse where the student can select parts of the expression to operate on and enter items into a keypad. On the right, you're going to see the cerebroscope's reconstruction of what it thinks the student is seeing and doing. And at the top, uh, the only thing we're using in real time to make these predictions, and that's the brain activation patterns. Okay, so let's start the movie if I can. Okay, so uh, a problem comes up, the student selects part of it. It's like all of it, actually, and is now <coughs> trying to produce a transformation. The student's going to make a strange error here. It involves confusion of addition with multiplication. And on the right, the left is the student. On the right, the cerebroscope has basically guessed what the student is doing and that particular error. The student is now going through a process, or will shortly, yeah, go through a process of correcting that, and the cerebroscope is doing the same. Uh, you'll notice that the cerebroscope isn't always quite in sync with where the student is. It's trying to predict at any moment in time what the student is doing. We're, but we're now into the second problem. We're a minute and a half into the task, and you can see the cerebroscope basically just using the activation pattern that's up here uh, is able to keep track of where the student is and predict what the student is doing. Um, I've seen this movie so often, it gets kind of boring. Um, but in any case, uh, <coughs> I guess we're, in, this is, I forget where's the third or fourth problem. I just wanted to show one more problem before we stop this. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to wait one more. But in any case, you can, you can get a sense of, it's a bill, again, right is prediction, left is uh, 
what it, it, the student is actually doing. And you can see generally things are okay. We're going to get to a moment where it makes us something of a misprediction. Um, here it is. So it turns out the student makes a sign error involving addition and multiplication, addition and subtraction, and then self-corrects without actually even getting any feedback. The cerebroscope predicts an error and a sign error, but in the wrong part of the equation. So that, that's in some sense a mismatch. And we're now four minutes in, and we're still in sync with where the student is. I guess with that, I could more or less move on. If I could get the thing to let me move on. Okay. So uh, that's the demonstration. How did we do it? Well, there's no magic here at all. We're basically working as in a typical tutoring situation. And as in a typical tutoring situation, you know the student's going to go through a sequence of problems. So we knew what problems the student was going to go through. We weren't inventing those just out of the brain activation patterns. Our task was to figure out when the student got the various parts of these expressions and whether the student was correct or incorrect on those particular steps. We know the brain patterns displayed by other students and by this student on earlier trial. So that's part of the information we have. We also know the behavioral patterns of other students. And this is actually exactly like a typical tutoring system that runs off of behavioral data. So we know what other students do. We know what the student did earlier. And we're going to put this all together to predict what this student is doing on this run or trial. Uh, as I said, <clears throat> one of the things we use is multivoxel pattern analysis. And this is the set of weights that are associated with making an error. We have weights associated with different states. Uh, might not be too <clears throat> obvious how to make much sense of all these weights, but some of them kind of make sense. So it turns out, for instance, uh, that there are strong positive weights in the region of the anterior cingulate, which is associated with making errors. Uh, so we, that's how we can recognize states in the image pattern. Uh, we combine this with a behavioral model. So essentially, every step that the student does, as really in a typical tutoring system, we know how difficult it is. Whether it is, in, uh, and this is actually a continuous thing, but I've discretized it in terms of three categories. So that there are problems which we classify as easy on day five, where the student is now only 1% of these steps, actually not problems, there are steps within a problem. Only 1% of these involve errors. Middle difficulties, uh, 6%. Uh, hard problems, 13% errors. So we also know uh, what the distribution of times would be for these different kinds of problems on the left if they do it correctly, uh, on the right if they do it incorrectly. And, and so we know for a specific problem the student is coming up to, what its difficulty profile will be, and we also know how well that student has done an earlier problem, so we can kind of tune that with that information about the specific student. And so what we're going to do is we want to combine the real-time data coming in, which is just the fMRI data, and our prior knowledge we have <coughs> from our behavioral model to interpret what this <coughs> particular sequence of scans is going to be. We essentially want to interpret it as some set of steps through the problems, correct and incorrect. And uh, this is the one equation I'm going to show uh, <coughs> at danger of having my audience just with that one equation. Uh, but it is the case uh, <coughs> that it really captures the essence of what's going on. Essentially, the behavioral model essentially gives us kind of the prior probability of any interpretation, a way of interpreting this. Uh, what we're interpreting is a sequence of scans. I'm not sure I've said it, but all the, all the research I'll be dealing with, we're collecting scans every two seconds. Uh, so it, we can, it gives us kind of the prior probability before we get any image data. And then the image data comes in. We, there are conditional probabilities of those images associated with a particular <coughs> interpretations, and so we can essentially sculpt from that prior probability and essentially come up with a posterior probability. We want the most probable interpretation of that data, which is what we're going to go with. That's, in some sense, I hope conceptually simple. It is potentially computationally difficult because there are an astronomical number of ways of interpreting those sequence of scans as steps through the problem. But fortunately, 
This is where hidden Markov models come in because they have efficient algorithms for identifying the most probable interpretation. So I've indicated here a little snippet of the model for this particular task. Uh, the, uh, so the student starts in a rest state. You may remember the little pauses between the problems. And all the problems involve four steps. Each of those steps can be performed correctly or incorrectly. So we see the transitions between them. The states in this diagram are really steps. Uh, this is a semi-Markov model because critically the duration that you're in any particular state is variable. It's not a fixed time. Uh, and what we're looking to do is find the most probable interpretation. Um, so I showed you a, one demo. Uh, I hope you found it fairly impressive. You might have thought it was cherry-picked, but really it isn't cherry-picked. It's quite representative, and we have run hundreds of blocks uh, like that, and I'll show you some statistics that come averaged over all those blocks. So this is our success at segmentation. I pointed out that the cerebroscope was sometimes a little bit ahead or behind uh, the student, but we can measure how close it is to being right on target by looking at the step a student is on on a particular scan and the step the cerebroscope ascribes to that particular scan. If they're the same, the difference is zero, otherwise we have a positive or negative difference. And you can see that uh, for 82% of the scans, we're, uh, we're correct. And actually, most of the errors are just one off. And probably won't come as any surprise to you, students don't go through these problems lockstep with two second scans going from one step to the next. So there are lots of edge issues about, in fact, even how you call them. So I think that's pretty good. You might say, well, do we need all this machinery? Can't we just do it by reading the, uh, the brain activation patterns? But if you only use fMRI data, you don't do well. You could say, maybe we just need the behavioral data like you have in your tutors. Uh, but it turns out that just with the behavioral data, you don't do terribly well. This is one of the big lessons, which is that the two sources of data together are much more powerful than either source is individually. Let me just show you one other measure of success. We were trying to call individual steps correct or incorrect. We would like to identify when students are making an error by their brain activation patterns. Uh, and so we would like to be able to be high on the y-axis. That's true classification of errors. But of course, there's a threshold here. And as we shift it, uh, we're going to get some, going to call correct steps uh, incorrect. And so we have a classic ROC curve here. We can look at the area under the curve. It's almost 95%. I think that's pretty good. So those are some statistics on the overall <coughs> data that we were working with. And uh, this is what we were doing up until about a year or so ago. Uh, I call these mind reading demonstrations. Probably the most impressive was a case where we followed uh, <coughs> people playing the children's game concentration, predicting what cards they were turning over and whether they were getting matches or non-matches. Uh, and the essential idea behind all these cases is kind of a wisdom of a cr crowds, which is that if you can get a convergence of enough noisy signals, you maybe you can actually hone in on the truth. And certainly any activity we get any, from any particular voxel is quite noisy, but if we put that all together, <clears throat> maybe we can, and we can, identify what is going on. And brain imaging is powerful compared to other methodologies just because it provides so many relevant signals. Uh, until recently, these have been mind-reading uh, uh, approaches which require a definition of ground truth, both to train the system and to judge whether you're successful. Uh, uh, the uh, tutoring case I just showed you, we have a computer log identifying exactly where the student was and what they were doing. So that was used to train and it was used to judge. Uh, however, the thought came that maybe we could take this convergence of signals and discover ground truth. In particular, discover models of how complex tasks are done. Kind of automatic science, that's, that's the promise here. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to describe uh, 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 some work in this particular direction. Uh, but first, I have to introduce you to the topic 
uh, that students are dealing with in all the rest of the data that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, these are pyramid problems. So I'm going to give you the instruction that students see uh, when, before they start working on pyramid problems. So they're told there's a notation for writing repeated addition where each term is one less than the previous. So for instance, 4 plus 3 plus 2 is written as $4.3. Since 4 plus 3 plus 2 is 9, we would evaluate $4.3 as 9, we write $4.3 equals 9. The parts of $4.3 are given names. 4 is the base and reflects the number you start with. 3 is the height and reflects the total number of items you add, including the base, the whole thing. $4.3 is called a pyramid. And in this session, you'll see a series of problems where essentially you have to solve for x, in this case, type 9. Uh, so uh, to give you a sense of what it's like to be a participant in this experiment, I'm going to give you, show you some protocols of students outside of the scanner. Uh, so uh, and here's uh, one problem, $6, 5 equals x. Uh, the student's protocol while solving it. 6 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2, 4, 15, 3, 18 plus 2 is 20. Not exactly saying everything that's needed there, but in fact, uh, the onset things are all correct. That is the correct answer. They get their feedback in green. And then after that, we give the students a chance to essentially give us a report of what was going on, a kind of a, a post-problem solving protocol. And so this is the protocol we got from the student <coughs> at that point in time. Okay? And so what students do is these are what we call regular problems. And they go through a series of these problems before the actual scanner session begins. And then we throw them some curveballs, what we call exception problems. Um, and I'm going to show you protocols, again, from students not in the scanner solving exception problems. So here's uh, one problem. Minus $9.4 equals x. Student says, so wait. It's one less. It's minus 10. You see a dot, dot, dot. That's a long pregnant pause. Uh, <coughs> minus 9 plus minus 10 plus minus 11 is 3. And then negative minus 42. Again, it's kind of skipping over some stuff. But in fact, they did the correct calculations, get the feedback in green. And now we get an opportunity for another reflection. OK, I'll give you one more. x dollars 4 equals x. All right. Student says, different. That's interesting. Dot, dot, dot. Long pregnant pause. 3x plus x and enters minus 2. I leave it as a challenge for all of you to figure out what that student was thinking. I know. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out the student made a sign error. So it gets the feedback in red. Wrong. And the... Uh, <laughs> all right. So that gives you a sense for what it's like to be a subject in this experiment. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, talk about the scanner study a little bit more, the experimental procedure. So it starts out with four seconds uh, of a fixation. And then uh, they have up to 30 seconds to solve the problem. They have a keypad, which they can enter the information in. And then there's five seconds, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. There are five seconds of feedback. Uh, oh, gee, where am I going? There we go. Five seconds of feedback, and then followed by uh, repetition uh, detection, uh, <clears throat> which is just an activity to kind of return the mind to a constant baseline. Obviously, it doesn't turn the mind off, but it gets it to a constant baseline. Uh, and we're going to be just analyzing the time that they're solving the problem. And the problems they solve include regular problems. And regular problems we define as having single-digit bases and heights. The heights are actually either 2, 3, 4, or 5, which is critical because if you're following the standard algorithm, that's the number of additions you're going to have to do. Uh, the exception problems, uh, well, we can monkey around with the base, make it negative, make it large. We could play around with the height. Uh, we could actually have a fractional base. Uh, we could have what we call double X problems. Uh, and there are some other exception problems as well. So these are the exception problems that we use. And 
So we go and do the experiment. Now, I guess uh, to give you a little bit of background here, uh, as some of you may know, we have actually developed an ACT-R model of sort of standard algebra equation solving, and it has successfully predicted a range of fMRI data. We took that model and extended it to deal with the pyramid problems, and it did predict the behavioral data, both for regular problems and exception problems. Uh, but then we went and did an fMRI experiment, and perhaps not surprising given past history, it could basically predict the imaging pattern we saw for regular problems, but it really fell on its face for those exception problems. And it's not like I wasn't willing to change my theory. I'm quite willing to modify my theory or the model to fit data. I just could not figure a way to do it. So I said, well, maybe the data is rich enough to tell me how to do that model. And so that's what we set out to do, and our plan was pretty simple. Uh, I've already described to you hidden Markov models. We were just going to search through all the hidden Markov model topologies and find the one that best fit the data. Uh, simple plan for theory discovery. Um, so let me just describe a little how that works. Um, so uh, this is a, a case of a pretty small hidden Markov model, just three states. But uh, what we do is we start with a maximally connected Markov, hidden Markov model like this, or just really a Markov model. And uh, we then estimate this best fitting parameters. I show all the transition prob probabilities here at one third, but uh, we'll estimate them. They won't stay one third. As I said, it's a semi Markov, so we have to estimate the duration in each one of these states. We assume that these distributions of state residents are discrete, because we deal in scans, approximations to gamma distributions. And we also are going to estimate a brain signature associated with each of these states. That's kind of the pattern of activity you would see in that particular state. And for pyramid problems, certainly not for all the applications, it's always been the case, at least for the problem-solving phase, this converges into a simple linear chain where all the transition probabilities become one. So that's, that would be the case for three state or any number of states, at least the number of states we've looked at. But it leaves open the question, what is the right number of states? So how do we determine that? And the problem here is that if you give yourself more states, you give yourself more parameters, you're going to fit the data better. Now. <clears throat> I see there's many papers <laughs> here and there, sort of dealing with kinds of issues like this. But it turns out standard uh, m metrics like the big metric just fall on their face really dealing with this problem. Uh, but we've come up with something that's much simpler, easier to understand, uh, and is <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> think conceptually really defensible, which is just leave one out cross-validation. And essentially what we do is we take our in principle, take our first k minus 1 subjects, estimate the parameters for that subject, and then we predict what the data is going to be for the kth subject. Uh, now, of course, <laughs> what we do is we rotate this around so every subject gets to be the last one. And we're going to prefer a more complex model to a simpler model if it provides a better fit for most of the subjects, but actually a better prediction for most of the subjects. Uh, the more complex model is certainly going to fit the k minus 1 subjects better, but it's an open issue whether it'll predict the kth subject better. And it turns out that you can actually do a significance test. Uh, the probability that a more complex model will <coughs> fit better than by chance can be basically determined by doing simply a sign test on the number of subjects that are fit better. So how many, so, how many states for pyramid problems? Well, uh, we did two experiments, uh, and here are the results from these two experiments. And what I have along uh, the x-axis is a variation number of states. Along the y-axis, I have the improvement of that number of states over one state measured in log likelihood. Uh, and uh, okay, so perhaps no surprise, two states is better than one state. All 20 of our 20 subjects in one experiment and 35 out of 36 in the other subject were better fit that way, in the other experiment were better fit that way. Three states is certainly significantly better than two, four better than three, and then it doesn't get any better. Uh, now, the interesting 
thing is that when you look at that original model, we hadn't thought of it that way, but there are four phases uh, that you could sort of uh, associate with states. The model first encodes the problem, and then, it, at least for exception problems, it plans how it's going to come out and try to solve it, and then it does a solution, then it generates the response. So I'm going to call these four states encoding, planning, solving, and responding. And we'll sort of see what their properties are like. So here's uh, the uh, four state solution in terms of time. Because um, remember, there's, uh, there's a distribution of residents in a particular state. So the first state, the encoding state, over 90% of the time, uh, you spend one scan in that state. Uh, it's occasionally two scans, and that's about it. The other states have much wider distributions of duration. Let's look at what the brain signatures are like. Uh, uh, so um, the encoding state, um, we see some activity in the visual regions and some activity in parietal regions, which we associate with building up a problem representation. Certainly, it's true in our algebra work. Um, the planning state, here's its signature, and its striking feature is this high activity in left parietal and prefrontal regions. Um, the solution state uh, actually looks kind of similar. It still has that high left activity. Uh, but actually, it, it turns out to be critical. The, the activity in the prefrontal area has gone down substantially. And now we're starting to see activity in the motor area. This is the left motor controlling the hand. And what students do is they do finger counting as they solve these pyramid problems. So that's what we're doing is we're picking up on the finger counting. And then we get to the response stage. Uh, and uh, here we see uh, some increase in visual activity, but really intense activity in the motor region because, of course, they're entering the response at that point in time. So that's what the four state solution sort of looks like. But it, it might be a little surprising, but it turns out the real information is in this first graph, which is the duration you spend in various states. Because what you can do is you can look at how the duration in various states varies with conditions of the experiment. And so this is an analysis of state duration for regular problems. Um, and as I pointed out, they vary in height, which controls the number of additions you have to do. Uh, and uh, it's pretty striking and apparent that the big variation in height is in the third state, the solution state. Uh, people are taking a little bit more than a second per extra addition. Uh, now, of course, that's... If it, that's where you would probably expect uh, to see uh, that uh, <coughs> increase, but in some sense it kind of confirms the power of this methodology, which is we can take what had been a long solution time, decompose it into its components, and see how each one of those components varies with features of the, of the task, which is something we just have not been able to do by and large, at least in problem solving up until now. As I said, this kind of tells us what we would expect to see. Now I'm going to show you the, the information that was really informative to me in terms of rethinking the model. So this is an analysis uh, of the time you spent in the four states for correct and incorrect problems, and problems that were regular are exceptions. And I've added, actually, a fifth category, timeouts, where people spend 30 seconds and they either don't respond or don't complete their response. Now, it's the case that, uh, <coughs> let's look at the encoding state. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, students take longer when they're going to make an error, which is kind of surprising. Just encoding the problem, already they're giving telltale signs that an error is going to be made. But what was surprising to me, and unlike the model I built, they're taking no longer for exception problems. Guided by the protocols, we had thought students would immediately jump on the uh, unusual features of the problem. But it seems, no, they just passively encode those exception problems. The effect of being an exception problem really comes out in the second stage, the planning stage. That's not surprising. But what was a surprise is students appear to be planning even for regular problems, whereas our model went straight from uh, the encoding to the solution for regular problems, skipping that. But that doesn't seem to be the case for the day of, in this particular experiment. We come to the solution stage. Uh, we find, again, a big effect of errors, very little effect. The uh, 
of exceptions, suggesting when students are making errors, they're basically kind of tripping over their calculations in this stage. Uh, when we get to the response stage, there's no real effect of being an exception or regular, uh, correct or incorrect. Uh, I guess comforting, they take very little time when they time out because, of course, they never at least complete their response in that particular case. Uh, so we had this uh, sketch, and then what we decided is we would take the four states and the information we'd gotten about it and build a, a modified ACTAR model. So it, basically to map those four states, uh, we uh, took the encoding state and we didn't, uh, we basically built a model just encoded what was on the screen and really didn't think about it at all. And actually ACTAR is very good at encoding things and not thinking about it. So <coughs> that worked out fine. Uh, the critical decision was modeling the planning stage. We decided to model it as the retrieval and adaptation of the instructions, but also feedback that participants were getting on previous problems. You know, that was really guided by the high activation, the lateral inferior prefrontal cortex. Uh, and then we modeled the solution as following those instructions, and we do have numbers of ACTAR models that are instruction followers. That was actually our standard algebra model. Uh, we added in finger counting for the pyramid problems. And then we had it, again, execute the response without much thought. And again, it's easy to build ACTAR models that respond without thinking. Uh, so uh, <coughs> that was the four-state model. Now, there's something that was disappointing to me in this model from where I started out in going into pyramid problems. Because I thought I would study how people really invented procedures out of whole cloth. Uh, but I've come to the conclusion that's rare. Most exception problems really can be uh, solved by just adapting the instructed procedure. So minus $9 for, it's a negative number. Oh, all right, I'll just do negative addition. And away you go and you come up with the answer. Uh, the clearest case of where you have to do some invention is what we call mirror problems. Here are some examples of them. But the interesting observation is the first time students see mirror problems, they only get 33% of them correct. And it turns out that one third of these problems have a guess of, have an answer of zero, uh, which gives you a basis for doing a lucky guess for these problems. And immediately after seeing the feedback, this rises to 71%. So we're modeling solutions of these cases as essentially recalling an adaptation of feedback. So this is the feedback you get on $200, 401. All right, so that's the, that's the sketch of the model. Now, let me show you a little bit of the gory information processing detail. Uh, this is 40 seconds of ACTAR going through one trial. Uh, and uh, ACTAR consists of a bunch of modules. Uh, there's a production module, which makes requests for various cognitive actions, goal changes, are on the second column. Uh, these green boxes are changes in the imaginal module, which involve changes to the problem representation. Uh, <clears throat> then we have some visual encoding in the fourth column. Retrieval, which is clearly a big part of the story, uh, <clears throat> in the fifth column. And then the manual module for programming various motor actions. Just to break this out into the structure of the task, there's a fixation period, followed by an encoding phase, followed by a planning phase, a solution phase and a response phase. Then there's a feedback, another fixation, and repetition detection. And just to instantiate this with respect to the specific problem ACTAR was solving in these 40 seconds, it got x dollars x equals 6. It <coughs> had to solve this by a guess and check procedure uh, and uh, was going to guess the square root of 6, round it up to 3. Uh, tried that out. It worked. Uh, and then it responded and keyed three. Uh, so that's kind of basically the model. And all these little lines are sort of 50 milliseconds passing here and there. So we're really down in the weeds in terms of exactly what's going on in the information processing. Well, how well does it do in accounting for the data? Well, here's the behavioral fits. And what I plotted here are the, <coughs> there were nine exception types in one of the experiment. And, uh, and then the last one's the regular category. And, I, and we're fitting here both the mean time for each one of these types of problems, but also <coughs> the uh, standard deviation in those various conditions. Now, the fact that we sort of have our predicted lines 
more or less where the data is, is no great credit to ACT-R because we estimate parameters which are the duration of these individual processes and we also estimate a variability in that to come up with that appropriate match. On the other hand, getting all the wiggles right is in fact credit to ACT-R, that's what the correlations reflect, uh, <clears throat> because they indicate that we are correctly capturing the complexity differences among the problems, which is what's driving those wiggles. So that's the behavioral fit, but we're really interested in the imaging data. So uh, <clears throat> let's go there. Again, this is the 40 seconds of ACT-R. And what we have are periods of time in which the various modules are engaged, and we can use those to make predictions for what the hemodynamic response should be in associated regions. So here's 40 seconds of motor activity. Uh, we can put it on its side. And this is sort of like a design matrix in SPM terms, if you know about uh, that uh, terminology. And essentially, we can convolve that with a hemodynamic response and get a predicted hemodynamic response for that particular trial. But that particular trial depends on exactly this particular pattern of motor activity, and each trial is going to have a different pattern. What we're really going to be assessing the model with is how well we can come up with fits to individual trials. I am not going to show you 3,000 individual trials uh, at this point in time, but I will give you a little sense of what some of the detail is like, uh, <clears throat> breaking out the data in more detail than you normally see it broken out into. So let's look at the match, uh, again, average data here, of uh, the manual module to a, a region in the motor cortex that we associate with it, where the hand is represented. Uh, and what I've done is I've broken out uh, problems that only took two scans for the student to solve three, all the way up to 13 two-second scans. Also in here is the uh, initial fixation and the cool-down period. Um, within each one of these panels, we have two-second scans ticked along, and all the dots are the actual data, the smooth lines are the predictions. What we're predicting is percent change from hemodynamic response. Uh, red are regulars, blue are exceptions. The reason why we only have blues down here is we only get exceptions taking this long. Uh, and the matchup is generally pretty good. Uh, it's not, uh, it, this one seems to work out pretty well. We can look at the match of the visual module to the fusiform, which is an area that we associate with it. And there's, you might see some points of deviation, but I don't think they're actually all that important. We can look at the match of the retrieval module to a region of the lateral inferior prefrontal cortex that we associate with it. And uh, <clears throat> the correlation is pretty good, but there's actually an informative point and systematic point of deviation. When regular problems, that's the reds, take abnormally long, as far as the model is concerned, you're just still solving a regular problem that doesn't involve that much retrieval. But participants are responding almost as strong to those regular problems as the corresponding exception problems, just in that for the participants, there's something challenging about that problem that the model is not crediting the participants with. And just to show you one other matchup, <clears throat> we can look at the matchup of the imaginal module uh, to the posterior parietal cortex, where we think, which we associate with the imaginal module concerned with building the problem representation a big deal in algebra. Um, and the correlation is, again is good, though you look at these long exception problems and the model's predicting some wiggles that just aren't in the data. And it turns out that of all the mismatches, this is the one that really indicates a flaw in the model, which I will explain in a moment. But first of all, I've shown you the matches between kind of hemodynamic response, prediction. All these curves go up and come down. Um, that's because that's, that's what the task structure does. You might think that's really all that we're predicting. So we could ask, well, <clears throat> does the uh, module best predict the activity with its associated region? So I have a summary of the correlations here. The main diagonal is where we want the correlations to be high. They are high, uh, though you'll notice they're kind of high sometimes off the diagonal too. Um, and uh, part of this is because all the, these regions are responding to the same task structure, and that's going to produce correlations in the data and, uh, and uh, in the uh, theory. But 
The other problem is that there's an inertia in the hemodynamic response, and that just uh, exacerbates the scan-by-scan -scan, uh, correlations. In contrast, we can look at the state-by-state -state matchup. We can apply that state analysis to the model. We can apply that state analysis uh, to the data and see how well things match up. And I think this turns out to be, I think, much more revealing. So this is the activity uh, in the brain uh, in the four uh, regions that we've talked about before. So for instance, if we follow the fusiform, which is the visual region, it starts low during the fixation, goes up for encoding and planning, comes down in the solution, goes back up for uh, the response uh, and the feedback. Uh, the motor module, that's I guess purple here, starts flat, starts getting up a little bit for the finger counting and hits peak when you're responding, probably no surprise. Uh, the posterior parietal cortex kind of builds up to a height and planning stays that height through the response and then drops off. And the uh, LIPFC, the prefrontal region, kind of rises to a peak at planning and drops off from that for that point forward. I've also plotted here fixation and feedback and interval. Uh, this is the model, and you can kind of try to compare the two if you want to. These are the correlations now with these more aggregate measures. And again, we get the strongest correlations down the main diagonal. But it becomes apparent if you look that there is a point of systematic mismatch. And this is the match of the posterior parietal cortex to the imaginal module, which is the lowest correlation in the main diagonal. And basically, uh, the brain is very active during the planning phase, which is what we see here. But the model is basically just doing retrieving during that phase, so the activity tends to drop off. So uh, what we, I uh, think, have learned that is that uh, essentially this planning involves more representational activity than we have currently put in our model. So in some ways, my work as an act, our modeler, is not done. Uh, I still have something to do to kind of get this right. And uh, I'm almost done, but I did promise you a look at individual trials, because that's really the basis for this whole activity, what's going on in single trials. So here are two individual trials. Uh, this is uh, two trials that took 20 seconds in, uh, to, for the two participants to solve. We're tracking activity in five brain regions. Um, we, again, include the fixation and the, the post-solution activity here as well. Um, and the first uh, case the student was solving $154, 4 equals x. And in the second case, the student was solving $207, 4 equals x, which we regard as similar large base exception problems. And it's really transparent they're doing different things on those two trials, isn't it? Um, well, they are. It's transparent to the model. If we look at the hidden Markov model, what we can do is for the 10 scans, they will associate a probability that the student is in a state on any one of those scans. And for this first problem, $154.4, four, uh, it turns out that the majority of the time is spent planning, which is actually unusual for large base problems. More typical is the hidden Markov model's interpretation of the right side, where there's a relatively brief uh, <coughs> encoding and planning in a long period of time uh, in the solution phase. Uh, so, <coughs> and it turns out we can look for the best fitting ACT-R runs, because ACT-R is a non-deterministic uh, model that runs and follows different paths, takes different amounts of time, etc. The best fitting match to this problem has ACT-R <coughs> deciding to do problem decomposition saying, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to do three-digit addition. I'm going to do 150 times four, and then do four plus three plus two plus one, come up with the answer, therefore the long planning time. Uh, the best ACTAR interpretation for the other one is the ACTAR just kind of <coughs> puts its head down and does the three-digit uh, addition to come up with the answer, and therefore we get long uh, solution period. Okay, so... That's kind of what the raw data is going, looks like. I'm going to show you one more example of the variability that happens in individual trials. But again, I'm going to average across uh, trials. Uh, I'm going to talk about timeouts. 
These are the cases where uh, participants took the 30 seconds and didn't finish and produce an answer. And we looked at all these trials and uh, sorted them, and they sort of sorted into four categories. So I'm going to show you the average state occupancy for each of these four categories. But the individual trials they'll actually look quite a bit like this in terms of uh, the hidden Markov model interpretations. So uh, this is the pattern that actually ACTAR does produce sometimes, which is that the encoding runs slow, uh, planning runs slow, solution runs slow, the 30 seconds are over, we haven't quite got there. Uh, so that's a pattern that we can see in the model that does produce timeouts. Uh, but a, a different pattern, which we never see in the model, is this one. It only happens in 12 cases. The other was 27. But it's quite interesting. I call it the deer in the headlights pattern, uh, which is basically the participant just sits there and codes and codes and codes and codes and doesn't get beyond that particular point. Uh, here's another pattern, uh, which is actually the plurality of these cases. Uh, and here, uh, the encoding goes quickly, but the student just seems to be spinning their wheels, trying to come up with a plan, not successfully planning. And uh, finally, uh, we have uh, this pattern, where uh, the uh, encoding goes kind of uh, fairly quickly, and the planning must be going quickly. These are average of trials, but there isn't much area under the blue and red curves. Uh, but uh, the majority, in fact, just seems to be forever solving the problem, like they're trying to do a plan that doesn't work, going around and around or whatever, and never can get to the end. So again, I think this shows you the richness that you can actually find in the data on individual trials if you just kind of put it through the kind of the right lens, I guess. All right, so I'm going to summarize. Uh, I've shown that we can interpret single trial imaging data for a range of mathematical problem solving tasks. And I've shown that this capacity can be leveraged uh, to discover the sequence of states that people go through in a non-routine mathematical task, as the pyramid task. And we've seen how oh, that can actually be used, uh, how we, that sketch, which we get from the hidden Markov model, can guide and apparently correct the development of an information processing model down at the level <clears throat> that we aspire to. And moreover, that kind of detailed model actually offers really interesting insights, I think, on what's happening on specific trials. If we could just get it right all the time, we'd really be in a position to, uh, do, <clears throat> to come up with really interesting interpretations of these trial-by-trial -trial variations. So to conclude uh, with the question I raised, I think brain imaging can provide insight into the structure of complex thought. Thank you.